Welcome back to Law & Crime Network. My name is Bob Bianchi. I'll be with you at 3 o'clock. We've been moving it. A lot of different cases, a lot of hot topics. But we have one of our very own, uh, Vincent Hill, a host here at the Law & Crime Network, that is on location in the Georgia versus Tiffany Moss case out there in Georgia. You may recall we talked about this earlier where Imani Moss, 10 years old, starved to death, the prosecutor says, lit on fire and put in a garbage can by the woman you see on the screen right there. The father of the child was also charged. He's pled guilty. He's getting a life sentence. You see a picture of him up there on the screen. And he is cooperating with the prosecution in the prosecution of Ms. Tiffany Moss, who, may I add, is representing herself um, in this potential death penalty action. Um, so, Vincent, uh, give us the lay of the land, brother. What's happening down there? Yeah, Bob, so I was in the courthouse most of the morning, and what's very interesting is they're bringing each potential juror in one by one and then asking those questions. Typically, we see uh, at least the entire seat of 12 people seated, and then they uh, are asked those questions. But the judge in this case is bringing the, them in one by one. And most of the people here, Bob, surprisingly say they are not in support of the death penalty, and that's one reason this jury selection has been going on for as long as it has. One lady that, uh, earlier today, I believe juror number 92, stated, hey, I'm an uh, ordained minister. I believe in redemption, not death penalty. Mm -hmm. Who are we to say someone needs to be put to death? But this is a very interesting case as well, because a lot of the people, at least this morning when I was inside the courtroom, Bob, were saying, hey, I can't understand why she's representing herself. They understand that's her right. But they said if it was them facing a murder charge, a death penalty case, there's no way they would be representing themselves. So jury selection is a very slow process because of those two issues, Bob. Yeah, Vincent, just to let our audience know, in a death penalty case, it may sound a little counterintuitive, but to be death qualified as a juror, you have to actually tell the judge that if the state proves its aggravating factors beyond a reasonable doubt that outweigh the mitigating factors, that you would follow the law and impose the death penalty, that you were capable of doing that. So um, I've had death penalty cases, Vincent, myself, that have gone on six, eight months trying to find jurors that would actually impose the law there. And as you've indicated, she's representing yourself. That's a little quirky. But, you know, Vincent, I'm also told that there's a civil suit that's been filed here against the Child Protective Agency down there in Georgia because there were apparently, or it's alleged, numerous contacts that they should have known or should have known, seen that this child was being abused um, and they did nothing about it. Could that be a potential defense for her in an odd sort of way that she just wasn't capable as a parent, she didn't really intend to do anything wrong, and somebody should have interceded on her behalf? Is it a defense? You, you know what, Bob? That could be a very liable defense here. You know, one thing that's interesting about Tiffany Moss, I sat behind her uh, this past Friday when I was in the courtroom. Of course, I sat uh, within feet of her this morning. You know, she's walking in the courtroom very confident, you know, and she's telling the judge, no questions for this juror, no questions for that juror. So she seems like she understands, but at the same time, Bob, it could be a trick to later come back and say, well, I had no idea what I, what I was doing, because the talk here in Atlanta is there has to be something wrong with you mentally, not only to burn your child, starve your child, your stepchild, but then to say, oh, I want to represent myself. So she may come back later and say, well, there were signs, you know, I was reported, nobody did anything about it. So... How are you going to hold me liable? So to your point, Bob, that could be a very liable defense. Interesting. Gene, um, I'm curious, uh, before we get to Gene, just uh, Gene, I want you to ask Vincent a question next. But uh, tell me about, Vincent, the prosecutor's statement that they're working with the father because they don't believe he was directly involved in the starving um, of the child or the mechanism of death. But yet he pled to a life without parole sentence. Uh, to me, it just seems a little that they had a tough case against him. Why, maybe I'm not getting it. Why did he plead out to such a draconian sentence? Responsibility to make sure the, ch the child is cared for, fed, and things of that nature. So why the father pled out to this case and why he's a witness in this case is, is quite troubling, it's quite strange. But again, this whole case is strange, Bob. I mean, who starves their 10-year-old child and then sets her on fire in a dumpster behind mm. the apartment building. When this case hit in Atlanta, I mean, it shook everybody. Anybody that was a parent here, that is a parent here, they were all devastated for little Imani. Yeah, what do you think, Gene? Well, I'd like to ask Vincent, um, at the guilty plea hearing uh, for the father, um, 
first off, I'd like to know the exact charge, and was there any uh, expressions by the prosecutor as to why they're sort of giving him a, a pass on the death penalty? Well, Gene, I don't want to uh, give any false information there. I really didn't follow the father's case as much as okay. I'm following, of course, Tiffany Moss. So I'm not sure there. But again, to your point, he, he should have received the exact same sentence as, or at least a potential sentence as Tiffany Moss here, the death penalty. Uh, of course, the jurors were read each potential sentence, life with parole, life without parole, and, of course, death penalty by lethal injection. Again, there were a few jurors this morning that just said, hey, I'm totally opposed to it. Even if someone commits a crime, who am I to say they should be put to death? So, you know, I, when I spoke to a bailiff earlier, the deputy inside the courtroom, he said they expect to get up to the 54 required jurors, but the judge wants 58. They expect that to happen today, but it's no guarantee. So hopefully we can see opening statements sometime tomorrow morning. All right, Vincent Hill, a host at the Law and Crime Network, a reporter at the Law and Crime Network. He's doing it all. I appreciate it, Vince. Uh, stay safe and uh, keep coming back. Absolutely, Bob. Thanks so much. You got it, my friend.